In order to do this inverse period measurement in the Docimex API, you're going to start with the Docimex create virtual channel of the CI frequency type, so that's the counter input measuring frequency. In order to get the inverse period measurement, that requires you to change the measurement method. So you'll notice that circled in this diagram is a measurement method. For the inverse period, you're going to choose low frequency with one counter option. From there, you're going to go ahead and use the start task and then the read to read the data out. We're then going to clear it and use a simple error handler. This example is an example of a non-buffered single measurement. Remember, non-buffered means we're not using Docimex timing VI, and we're only taking one measurement. We're not continuously looking at the different measurements. The next method for measuring frequency that we're going to talk about is the high frequency using two counters, otherwise known as counting pulses in known time. The second method uses two counters. The first one is going to generate a pulse train with a known frequency, and the second one is going to perform the period measurement. So let's start by looking at counter zero. Counter zero is the one that's going to generate a pulse train. This counter is automatically allocated, and you don't actually have to configure this counter. So it automatically does it for you in the Docimex API when you choose the method type, the measurement method of high frequency two counters. Counter one performs the period measurement using an external signal as a source instead of an internal time base. Counter 1's gate signal comes from the output of counter 0, so that pulse train that we generated. Since we know the frequency of counter 0's output, we know exactly the length of the gate cycle on counter 1. Based on the number of source edges that arrive on counter 1's source, we can then can deduce the frequency by dividing counter 1's period measurement by the gate period. Let's take an example. Let's say if counter zero outputs a pulse train of 10 hertz and the gate period is 0.1 seconds. If during that time we count 100 source edges, we know that the source frequency on counter 1 is going to be 100 hertz plus or minus 1 divided by 0.1 the gate period or 1000 plus or minus 10 hertz. So let's recap. Counter zero is going to create the pulse train generation and counter 1 is going to make the period measurements. The signal that you're going to want to measure is going to go in counter 1, and counter 0 is automatically set up for you in the Docimex API. From there, using the two counters, it'll generate a frequency, and it'll calculate it for you using two counters. So let's look at how to do this in the Docimex API. So to use this frequency measurement, we have to specify that we want to measure high frequency with two counters. We'll do this in the Docimex Create Virtual Channel. So remember, we're still going to use the CI frequency, so the counter input frequency. However, the method, measurement method, is the high frequency with two counters. There is also another configuration called measurement time. This measurement time is going to determine the length of time to measure the frequency of the digital signal. Measurement accuracy is going to increase with an increased measurement time and with an increased signal frequency. However, if you measure a high frequency signal for too long, the count register could roll over and that will result in an incorrect measurement. In this, we're also going to add a Docimex timing VI. The timing that we're going to set is implicit and we're going to set it to finite samples so it only takes a finite amount of samples. By doing this, we're making this a buffered operation. From there, we'll go ahead and do the start and the read to get the data out as well as to clear the task and look at the simple error handler to make sure that we're not ignoring any errors. The next type of frequency measurement that we're going to talk about is called large range and it's also going to use two counters, or, or otherwise known as measuring time of known number of cycles. This measurement also uses two counters, except this time the counter generating the pulse train, counter zero, uses an external signal as the source, and the counter performing the period measurement, counter one, uses the internal time base as the source. Now this is different than the other one that we looked at with two counters. But, like the high frequency with two counters method, this method uses a pulse train from counter zero's output to gate the period measurement on counter one. The advantage to this method is that it introduces less error than methods one and two. Counter one is al automatically allocated and you actually don't have to do anything to configure this counter as well. Let's try an example to make sure we understand this concept. So suppose we program counter for a pulse train generation with pulse specs of 5 and 5. What that means is the delay and the width are each made up of 5 periods of the source signal. 
and then that the period of the resulting pulse train then consists of 10 periods of the source signal. Now, let's suppose for counter one, we can figure that for the period measurement, and we go ahead and use the internal time base of the 20 megahertz as its source. If counter one registers 100 source edges during one gate period, we then can deduce that the gate period lasted five microseconds. Remember, it's the 50 nanoseconds times the 100 edges. Backtracking, we can then conclude that the external signal wired to counter zero's source had a period of 0.5 microseconds or a frequency of 2 megahertz. In general, the equation that you're going to use for this to calculate frequency is going to be the pulse specification 1 plus the pulse specification 2 multiplied by the time base in this example which was the 20 megahertz time base divided by the number of sources of source edges so that's 100 in this case so that's what the counter counted how many edges they were and then plus or minus 1 for inaccuracies. Let's go ahead and look at how to do this within the DACMX API. For this frequency method, we're going to specify the measurement method as large range with two counters. So we're still going to use the CI frequency, so the counter input frequency, as we did for the last two frequency calculations. However, we're going to change the method to large range with two counters. You'll also notice that there is a divisor input. The divisor specifies the value to divide the input signal by so that we can create a lower frequency signal that the second counter can more easily measure. The larger the divisor, the more accurate the measurement. However, too large a value could cause the count register to roll over, resulting in an incorrect measurement. We're also going to use the DACMX timing VI. Again, we're going to use the implicit for finite samples, making this a buffered measurement. In addition, we're going to go ahead and use the start, read, clear, and then check for errors, like we had done in the previous methods just to make sure that we are starting the task, we're therefore reading, clearing the task, and checking that there aren't any errors on the signal. In the previous examples that we've looked at, we've looked at using the timing, the DACMX timing, to be implicit. However, we can also choose timing for frequency and period measurements using the sample clock. And some devices can actually return an average measurement of all periods since the previous sample clock pulse instead of just measuring only the period immediately preceding the current sample clock pulse. In order to do this, you can use a property called Enable Averaging. It's a DACMX channel property node, and it's associated with those measurement types in order to enable averaging. A good reason to enable this property node is when you have high frequencies and a varying range of frequencies. So you're going to go ahead and get an average of all of the periods rather than just the immediate value preceding the sample clock. In the previous examples using the DACMX API to measure frequency, we've looked at implicit timing. However, we also have something called sample clock timing, enabled by the new input to the counter, the sample clock. All counter measurements except for semi-period support sample clock timing. Similar to the sample clock timing in like an analog acquisition, the sample clock determines when a measurement is stored in the onboard memory. This way, the data rate and the read latency are decoupled from the frequency of the signal being measured. When the Enable Averaging DACMX channel property node is set to true, each sample clock will store into memory both the number of complete periods between sample clocks and the period measured during those complete periods. DACMX will calculate the average frequency using these measurements therefore having a higher resolution for large range measurements, which only requires one counter module. And because of this sample clock timing, it is decoupled from the frequency of the input signal. In this next section, we're going to talk about measuring pulse width. We're going to start out by describing what a pulse width measurement is, and then secondly, we're going to describe how to measure it using the DACMX API. To get started, let's define what pulse width is. The pulse width of a signal is the period of time that the waveform is at logic level high. So you'll notice in the graph, the width is described as when that signal is high. It is called the pulse width of the signal. To use a counter to measure pulse width, we're going to go ahead and use the gate, the source, and the count register of the counter. We're going to place the signal that we want to measure in the gate, so that's the input of the gate, and the source will be a time base of known frequency. We can then basically use that known frequency
time of our time base and the value of our count register to measure the pulse width. Pulse width measurements are very similar to period measurements. The only difference is where we stop counting. With period measurements, we started and stopped our counting with the two rising edges on the gate signal. However, with pulse width measurement, we only want to count during the pulse width. So we start our counting on the rising edge and end it on the falling edge. You can see this on the picture above. It's also possible to start the counting on the falling edge and you can stop with the rising edge. The formula for calculating pulse width is the same as that for the period. The pulse width is equal, going to equal the number of counts times 1 over the source frequency. Let's take an example. Let's say we have a source of 100 K Hertz. For that formula, we're going to want to calculate pulse width so that we have two counts and we know that the source frequency is 100 K Hertz. So it's 2 times 1 over 100 K, which gives us 0 0.02 milliseconds for our pulse width. When measuring pulse width, there's always going to be a minimum pulse width that you're going to have to be greater than in order to actually measure it. The reason being is there's a minimum delay that is needed from the time when a counter senses a rising or falling edge until it can sense another rising or falling edge. And that delay is known as the minimum pulse width. The minimum pulse width is actually just going to depend on the counter chip that is used in your data acquisition device. Uh, for example, the minimum pulse width for both source and gate of a DAC STC chip is 10 nanoseconds. However, specifications for the minimum pulse width of your counter can be found in the hardware manual for the data acquisition device. Let's go ahead and take a look at how to use the DACMX API to measure pulse width. The first thing you're going to do is use the DocMX Create Virtual Channel with the type of CI Pulse Width. So again, we're using the counter input Pulse Width. You want to make sure that you set your minimum and your maximum values of the unknown pulse as accurately as possible. The reason being is this will allow NI DocMX to choose the best internal time base for your application. From there, we're going to start the task like we always do, and then we're going to read the task, and we're going to read the pulse width from there. At the end, we always want to clear the task and then check for errors. In this demonstration, we're going to demonstrate on how to measure the pulse width of the signal. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and use the counter. Again, we're going to use the counter on the CDAC chassis, so that's the counter on the 9178. And then from there, we've hooked this up to the trigger that we've been using, so that's PFI0, um, so that's the terminal that we're going to be measuring the pulse width of. Uh, we're going to start the edge on the rising edge. We're going to measure it in seconds. And then finally, we have a maximum and a minimum value that we've set. So let's go ahead, and we're going to run the VI, and I'm going to click this twice, and it's going to measure that pulse width of when I started to when I ended. So you can see that this one, it measured it at 0.177, and that's again in seconds. Now if I do it again, you'll see if I hold it a little longer, it goes up to 0.193. So you can tell that it's working based on like how long you, before you click the second time. So let's go ahead and look at this block diagram. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we're going to start out with a different create virtual channel that we've done in the past. This one's the CI pulse width. So again, that's the counter input pulse width. We've set our min and our max value. We're also setting what counter we're using and then the units, as well as the starting edge, so whether that's rising or falling. From there, we're going to use a DACMX channel property node to set the terminal that we're taking. So this is our trigger terminal, right? So it was hooked up to PFI0. And then from there, we're going to do a DACMX start task and then a read to read the pulse width. Finally, we're going to clear the task and then do the simple error handler to make sure that there are no errors that occurred on our task. The last type of measurement that we're going to talk about is duty cycle. So we're going to describe what it is and then how to measure it using the DACMX API. Duty cycle is basically the ratio of pulse width to period. And what that means is the pulse width is basically the high time of your signal, so the width of your signal, over the pulse period, which is from rising edge to rising edge or falling edge to falling edge, so the, the period of your signal. And so if we were to take an example, if your digital signal has a period of 10 milliseconds and its pulses are 2 milliseconds long, 
that signal is going to have a duty cycle of 20%. This figure illustrates two different waveforms with different duty cycles. Notice that the waveform with the duty cycle of 50% is at logic level high a lot more time than the duty cycle with 30%. Now this just goes back to the equation, remember the first, the top wave. In order to measure duty cycle in the DACMX API, you're going to start by using the DACMX create virtual channel of CI duty cycle, which is using the counter input duty cycle. From there, you're going to have four input parameters. You're going to have your min and the max frequency that you expect, the counter that you're using, as well as the starting edge. From there, you're going to select a DACMX channel property node, and that's going to specify what terminal contains the digital signal that you want to measure. From there, we're going to just start the task like normal. Uh, we'll go ahead and read the value, clear the task, and then use a simple error handler to make sure that we did not miss any errors that occurred on the task. For the first question, go ahead and name four ways to count edges. The four ways that we talked about to count edges. What is the simplest method for measuring a frequency using a counter? The answer to what is the simplest method for measuring a frequency using Match the following terms with their definitions. If you are looking for information about quantization, in conclusion, this, in this lesson we have learned about the basics of using counters to analyze a digital signal. We first talked about edge counting. We then talked about different ways to measure frequency. We talked about measuring pulse width after that, as well as measuring duty cycle. Remember, in addition to specifying the counter that you want to use, you also must specify the terminal that contains the digital signal that you want to measure.